Well, good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask all in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices so as not to interfere with proceedings. Um, I have apologies from Fulton McGregor, committee member. And the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, today we commence our evidence uh, for this part on bank closures, and we have with us five witnesses today, so welcome to all of you this morning. Um, first of all, we have Pete Chima, who is the Chief Executive of the Scottish Grocers Federation, uh, Tim McCormack and Ferhan Ashik, both of them shopkeepers, no doubt will hear about your businesses in the course of evidence, Barry McCulloch, who is Senior Policy Advisor to FSB Scotland, and Phil Prentice, Chief Officer, Scotland's Towns Partnership. So welcome to all five of you. Uh, and just in the interest of transparency, I should mention that um, Gordon MacDonald, committee member, is the convener of the cross-party group in the Scottish Parliament on Independence Convenience Stores, and both myself and John Mason are members of that cross-party group. So if I might uh, start with a general question uh, to uh, the panel members and I think probably to our two uh, shopkeeper guests today in particular. Um, have your businesses been affected by bank closures or other businesses in the communities where you yourselves operate and if so, how? I don't know who would like to start? And, and, and I should say if you want to come into the discussion please indicate by raising your hand and I'll try to bring any panel members in at that point. Don't feel you have to answer all or um, you know particular questions. The sound desk will operate the mic system, so you don't need to press any buttons. Um, Tim McCormack. Well, as it happens, I've been involved in two um, bank closures. I've had two businesses over the last few years, and uh, one of them was a post office in Duns, and the Bank of Scotland was only a few doors away and it decided to close on a Tuesday and Thursday. So I had the opportunity to see the effect on my business because I also sold uh, cards and stationery. And so I could see the effect on the business during those days where it was closed, and it was remarkable. I mean, the, the takings, the retail takings, on the days it started to close um, were down considerably, up to 50%. And then when I moved to Coldstream, I managed to get out of the post office business and moved to Coldstream only 10 miles away. Um, bought a little news agent there and only a few doors down from um, the Bank of Scotland again. And uh, it decided to close last August. Closed completely. Um, so sales went down overnight by 20%, not just because of the actual um, branch being closed, but the, the removal of the ATM, the external ATM, was very significant, and significant not just for me, but for the pub opposite and for the businesses near me, um, had a, a tremendous impact. And to the extent where now I've had to lay off, well, they've left, um, uh, we managed to find other jobs, but the two girls that worked for me have had to go, and I'm going to be in, end up working 60 hours a week just to keep the business going to pay off the, the loan that I rather stupidly undertook. So, yes, it's had a significant impact on me. Um, thank you. And Ferhan Ashik? In terms of bank closures, I want to look at this a little bit more holistically. Bank uh, closures is one thing, but the new ATM charges are potentially coming in as well that we're going to f discuss probably further down the line, and potential post office closures um, holistically are have, will have a negative effect. In my, my town, in Preston Pans, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, which was the only branch shut down about a year and a half ago, there was no consultation at that time. Um, we did find out a few weeks prior to it closing that it was closing. And uh, the banks did give us um, some sort of support in terms of how we could mitigate our tra uh, travelling to branches further afield. However, from my, from my case, it turned out to be a much more painful transition. It took me about three months to overcome that first barrier, and that was primarily because 
Um, it happened to be my relationship manager at that time who went on to long-term terminal um, sick leave. And uh, the replace replacements didn't have a clue what the actual way to circumvent. My biggest problem was the change giving aspect. My business uses a lot of change every week and I need it um, to run my business effectively. Otherwise, it just comes to a crashing standstill. And I had to go down to Musselburgh and constantly go through a 20 minute traffic jam. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Musselburgh. The high street is horrendous for the traffic. <laughs> then you go into the branch and because everyone is now trying to come to Mus uh, Musselburgh, the queues are horrendous. Then you've got Trenent um, on the top side as well. Now, getting into Trenent was quite easy. Parking was a massive problem, and um, the queues, I used to, when it was happening to me, I was taking pictures of the queues and constantly tweeting RBS and telling them what a nightmare they're, um, and they're putting me under. Um, I had, over time, uh, over the three to six months, mitigated this, obviously using the post office um, as a way to get change. However, the problem with that is it's only the one post office you're designated to, that is your post office branch. If I've come, say, come into this committee hearing and I need a change, I would have to go back to that post office to get the change as opposed to being able <laughs> to go any post office using my card. And that is a service that I've lost, whereas in the previous, if the, the branches uh, with RBS, I could have just gone to any branch I wanted to. Um, same with, the, with regards to money deposits. Um, putting, it's a cash-rich business. Um, the FSB and the SGF have done reports that 70-odd percent or 75 percent of uh, businesses still use cash. Well, for a convenience store, it's actually as, as high as 85%. I've got some stats here from my own business. That's how high it is, and only 15% is actually used by a card. Now, <clears throat> because this was happening, and I have a second store in Levin Hall, um, I foresaw to put an, a self-filling ATM machine so I don't actually have to now transfer, go over to uh, branches to deposit my cash. But <coughs> given what Link is saying um, at the start of this year, uh, towards the end of the year, that is going to come under a threat again. And uh, I will be, it will be devastating to my business. I won't really know how to overcome this issue. Sorry, I went a little bit further. No, that, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. And if, if you do have further information you would like to submit to the committee, you can do that in writing. You may not want to submit the accounts you referred to, but if there is anything any of the witnesses wish to submit after this hearing in, in writing, then please feel free to do so. Pete Chima. Yeah, I mean, the current, as Fernanda said, is having an absolute devastating effect on, on local businesses. And, and the reason for that is that they're having to travel um, in most cases, about an hour back and forth. So that causes really security issues as well as anything else. It causes um, insurance issues, um, the extra man hours, especially in a time when um, businesses are um, having to cope with cumulative cost pressures such as auto enrolment and, and the extra pressures that the government has put on, on businesses. Um, uh, such as a living wage and a national uh, living wage, the extra rates that have come through. So for them, to, for small businesses to take on extra people to cover when they're, when they're away to the bank is a huge issue. Um, so travelling, car parking fees um, is, is all an issue. Uh, the, the fact that they're having to um, uh, bring change and carry that in full view from a high street location Back to their uh, back to their store is another issue. I mean, it's taking the basic fundamental rights um, of, of a business to do uh, banking uh, away uh, away from them. Uh, Fernand's absolutely right. The I mean, our survey shows that 76% of all cash handling um, is, is still done in retail stores. Um, yes, London um, is is down to about 55%, but this is Scotland. And if you look at some of the rural locations, it's over 80% the amount of cash that is handled on a daily basis. Also, the, the, the fundamental uh, point that banks are making in terms of um, bank closures, they've never really looked at the commercial aspect. They've just looked at the overall aspect. And if you look at the overall aspect, yes, personal banking um, is, is definitely on a decline, but not commercial banking. Commercial banking is still... At the, is going at the same rate, but they've never actually done the full analysis 
uh, and, and that's where they've actually failed. Thank you. Um, Barry McCulloch and... Thank you. Um, I think given this is the committee's first session on bank closures, it's, it's only right to understand the scale that, that Scotland has, has seen in the past in the past few years. So since, since 2013, um, there's been um, a, a whole host of closures. In 2013, there were over 1,100 banks operating in Scotland. That figure, according to our own research, is set to drop to under 800 by the end of this year. I will preface that by saying that there are our figures because there are no official up-to-date figures available um, since the CMA published its report in 2015. So, in part, we're, we're staring into the dark um, somewhat. But what this means in practice is that there's a number of towns that have no banks. Um, you have Gourick, Press and Pans, Loch Gailey, Kilmacombe, um, and these places are growing in numbers. And I think, as, as people um, before me mentioned, these have a range of business impacts. I'll, I'll just talk about one or one or two for the moment. You know, the impact on cash flow is significant. Cash is still the most popular payment method for consumers. Business owners need to be able to deposit that cash safely and securely. If they can't, that hits their cash flow. Um, secondly, the closures lead to a range of additional costs and hits of productivity. Time spent travelling to distant branches if you're in a remote and rural community is time taken away from the business. If you're someone like Fairhan in Press and Pans, that could be up to four hours a month. We have members in, in the Highlands where that's 12 hours a month you have to cover. There's a significant opportunity cost there for the business owner, um, which they would rather not have to deal with. And lastly, the replacements put in place are poor substitutes, whether that's online banking, mobile banking units, or or indeed post office access. They are no substitute for a functioning, functioning fully capable bank branch and our members frequently report problems with the, the substitutes that have come into place. Yes, and um, Phil Prentice. Uh, I'm maybe going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, most of these guys will be on our, either our board or in our membership. So Scotland's Towns Partnership was created by Scottish Government to take forward new approaches to repurposing the High Street. And we represent a very broad church. So as part of this process, we came to it belatedly, so <coughs> I've yet to collect in all of the uh, opinion, and I'll send that in in due course. But by and large, we're actually not against branch closures, because if you take a look at how society is moving on and how we transact, the bank is no longer seen as an attractive footfall generator in the, in the heart of town centres. But I would caveat that with there's two conditions. So we're, we can see why branches have to shut. You can't argue against the fact that less than 1% of banking customers actually regularly use a branch. You know, any business model can't stack up against that. But the, the, the two preconditions that I think we need to interrogate much more thoroughly is, as the guys have pointed out, some form of last branch in town, whether it's a multiple solution across the brands, whether it's one of the disruptors like a Unity Bank that, that, that's coming to the fore. There has to be something. So I've got a conversation going with RBS, the co-op bank, and Unity to have a look at how could we potentially build in some resilience. For example, in a lot of rural and remote communities, you've already got a co-op. So could the co-op bank actually be integrated into the convenience store to make sure there's some form of local bank? But by and large, I think we have to just see that we are moving towards becoming a cashless society, much more transactions via contactless, et cetera. And the, the second thing that, again, would, would need to be a condition, and I think this is probably where some of the anecdote and emotion comes to the fore, banks traditionally have got a big footprint in the high street, and RBS in particular, you know, they're the most characterful and dominant buildings in the heart of the town. And whenever they decant, very quickly it just leaves a sense of decline and despair because very often there isn't a use promoted to come in on the back of that. So I think it's more to do with a toxic legacy for the branch, for the bank. If people in three or four years' time are coming into a high street and seeing a big RBS sign on a dominant building that's now vandalised and people are paying empty rates on. So there has to be something around last branch in town and what do you do with the banking estate? 
there are so many opportunities for community enterprise, for startups, for restaurants, for childcare provision. And I think the bank should be put in a position where they're being more proactive and not just walking away. I just, I just wonder about that, that last point, if I could come back to you on that. Um, I think the, the comment from some of our other witnesses was that cash is what tends to be used in retail. Now, um, if it is the case that bank branches are being closed and small businesses have to travel quite far to bank cash and so forth, um, does that put them at a disadvantage to large uh, operators who um, operate out of much larger businesses and also to small shops in town centres. And if that is the case, uh, how how is what is to be done to ensure that town centres don't end up with all these closed shops um, if, in fact, the way things are set up is simply to the advantage of large retailers? Well, I would counter that. I think... Again, a lot of this is sort of smoke and mirrors, and, and a lot of it's emo emotional. And that's probably just down to the fact that people see, at very quick, in a very quick space of time, lots of branches have closed very quickly. And I think we collectively have let that run away to a certain extent, because I still think that there is a need for some form of last branch in town provision. However, Gurick is my local town, and a... You know, it functions very, very well. In fact, Gurick is the most highly independent niche retail town in Scotland. So it sort of counters that argument. Uh, these guys are able to function because they've got ATM. So whilst the bigger branches have shut down, uh, some of them have been repopulated with uh, sort of craft food and, again, high-quality niche retail. So it's actually created a space in the town for, for new investment. The ATM provision allows the banks to, to or the, the businesses to, to, to bank their cash. So they can put checks in, they can deposit through ATM. So there is a sort of mobile solution still left in the town. I, I, I genuinely think that we need to explore this in much more depth because at the minute the banks are sort of almost waiting for a good day to release bad news and then just to sneak away quite quietly. I think we need to get them into a room and say, this has to be based on demographic. It has to be based on the makeup of the SME population. So our ageing uh, population. But again, if, if, if you dig deep into that, I mean, my mother's 80, she lives in a very remote Irish town. I do all her banking for her online. You know, she doesn't ever need to go to a branch. So I think we need to move away from, OK, yes, in a short period of time, we need to come up with some form of interim solution. And collectively, the banks should be uh, put in a position to deliver that that meets the needs of these guys. But long term, I think we should be more concerned about the estate and the future of the high street and what those properties could do to actually repurpose and reinvent. So there's, there's two conversations there. But again, these guys are sort of stuck in the middle just now where it is quite difficult. Um, there because there's the larger organisations, larger shops have their own uh, <coughs> cash and transit pickups or their own security pickups. It's, it's the smaller shops like ours who deal in cash primarily that require to deposit it into, well, I use the post office now, which is uh, quite handy. Um, but even those are closing and moving, and particularly when they move somewhere else. For checks, I wouldn't put a check near a post office because they, they lose them. Um, so I'd have to travel by bus to Kelso to deposit my um, customers' checks. So one net effect of the local bank closing is that I will... Um, stop taking checks in my business, which is upsetting to the older generation who use them. So. Pete Chima wanted to come back in there. Yeah, I mean, to some points I would agree with Phil, but if Phil, if you're trying to encourage retail to move into high streets, there has to be a solution. And it, the majority of money taken over the counter is still cash. So we can't get away from that. It has to be banked somewhere. In terms of ATMs taking cash and that being the alternative, it's only the internal ATMs that are taking cash. The external ATMs that are provided by all the big players, whether it's RBS, whether it's Bank of Scotland, whether, whether um, it's Satander, um, whether it's Cash Zone, whether it's Your Cash, Hanko, whoever it might be, they're external ATMs and they don't have a facility to input cash. You, you, the, um, the, the, the shop cash in, into those ATMs and the interlink charges that are being, uh, being reduced from 25 pence to 20 pence which will mean in future 
um, and it's already happening that some um, retailers have been told, well, you've either got to be you got, you've either got to charge for these ATMs, or we're going to take your commission rates away. Now that's in a time which which has been exacerbated because banks, for example, charge us for inputting cash. Now, predominantly in the past, we used to have fixed charges, and by having fixed charges, we used to be able to pay, say, about hundred pounds a month or one hundred and fifty pound a month. But the average turnover of a, of, a, of a convenience store at the moment is somewhere around about the £14,500 mark. But taking into account lottery, pay point, and everything else, that, that probably goes to around about £22,000. So by the time that money's banked, that's going to cost them £143 a week. That's nearly £7,500 a year. So the banks are not only closing banks, but what they're also doing is making them go on to the maximum fixed charges, which is roughly between 65 pence to 67 pence per 100 pounds. Um, I want to move on slightly, so come to follow up from Jamie Halcorn Johnson and then further questions from Gillian Martin. You will have a chance to come back in and may want to pick up one or two of these points in your other answers. So, Jamie Halcorn Johnson. Thanks very much, Kavina. Um, it was just actually on the points that you were, that you were making there, and I think uh, P. Jima has kind of answered some, some of the questions I was going to ask. But in terms of you, you will all hold business accounts with the bank, is your business account held with that, with that local branch, or is it from a more centralised uh, branch? Um, so my branch um, has been moved to Trinent. So my local branch is Trinent. Um, that's where it's held. Um, same with Long Nidri and Port Seaton. Now, there's an issue right there in itself. Um, if you were a, re a, um, a resident in Long Nidri or Port Seaton, you would travel to Preston Pants. There was a direct public uh, bus that goes there, and you would get off. Now your local branch is Trinent, so you have to go to Preston Pants, get off the bus, get onto another bus going to Trinent. Trinent. Now that's one pound seventy one way, then one pound seventy going to Trinent, then back down to Preston Pad. That's nearly five pounds just to get access to your cash again. So I think that's disadvantaging a lot of people. I'm lucky I have a car so it doesn't affect me personally, but it's a lot of people that does affect. It's just kind of rather how, how the, 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 the bank looked at those uh, you, you know, those individual branches, whether they looked and said, right, well there are a number of business customers out of that branch and a number out of that, or whether it was all centralised in a mm -hmm. And it, we weren't told how that worked. We were just told that was your branch. The only thing we were uh, allowed to do was whether we can keep our sort code. Uh, was still a Preston Pound sort code, or did you want to change it to a Trinan sort? That was the only thing they asked us. And was there any discussions with that branch? Was there any consultation uh, in terms of, you know, these are the, this, this is what we're thinking of doing. This is how we're going to. We're looking at losing this branch. You, you might have to move there. The honest answer is yes and no. Uh, there was initially no consultation. Eventually, Ian Gray, MSP, kicked up a fuss within the community, and they offered us, uh, offered Ian um, a meeting, which was uh, scheduled to about a week or, to, uh, or less than a week before the branch was actually going to close. So, what that actually was going to actually benefit in any way, there was it was neg it was negligible. And, and none of those discussions kind of involved, well, would you be willing to pay, you know, and I, I know as Pete, you, you mentioned, you know, already large charges, would you be able to pay a slightly increased charge to make the, that local branch more sustainable? No, no, we weren't given that option either. Okay, thanks. Julian Martin. Um, just in the interest of declaring everything um, as other members have done, I should mention that I'm the deputy convener of the towns and town centres uh, cross party group. Um, and I'd like to ask, uh, follow up on some of the things that Phil Prentice has talked about, about the, the town centre. I mean, you've, you've already alluded to what, should, what you think broadly could happen to vacated premises of banks. Well, when, when we have a situation that, that, that a large building, as you mentioned, Royal Bank, is vacant for a long period of time in a town, what, what impact does that have on the town centre? Um, probably it's more of perception rather than economic uh, problems. Albeit, you know, we want to see as much property in the town centre work hard for the town centre. Uh, as long as it's a short-term churn, you'll always have some sort of vacancies and voids as things chop and change. But I think it's more of a it's, it's more of a psychological blow to the town when you walk in and you see a large branch that used to be the hub, albeit 20 years ago, of a lot of commercial activity being allowed to lie fallow. 
And I think there has to be some sort of prerogative put onto these banks to say, look, engage with your local community planning partners, engage with your local community, because with changes in legislation that are coming around CSOs, compulsory <coughs> sale orders, etc., local communities will be able to come in and sort of almost agitate for improvement. We've got a lot of issues around uh, housing, and again, we want to repopulate town centres, so why aren't we looking at transforming some of these uh, vacant buildings into accommodation for people to live? But also just thinking about how high streets need to think beyond retail, and that's really important. Whilst we're very supportive of all the retailers we work with big and small, the future of the high street will not be dictated to by retail-only solutions. It's much more comprehensive, and I think the Scottish Government have got the right approach in terms of a, a very wide and collaborative view on how towns can be repurposed around housing, around digital, around quarrying up public services, town centre first principle, etc. So, uh, yeah, it's not nice to see the, the branches lying empty. Very quickly in vibrant cities, they tend to just get sold off in a commercial deal, and very quickly you'll see something like a pub or a gym or something like that move in. But that's different whenever you get out to the peripheral secondary towns where you've got a sort of subprime market and a lack of confidence, dysfunction in the property market. And I think that's where the banks need to show some sort of social conscience and actually step up to the plate. To be honest enough to say they've probably written the capital value down as part of the financial crash. So these are just windfalls to the banks. Why can't you do your societal duty and meet the needs of that local population? It could be something for older generations coming with younger generations. It could be co-working environments, incubators, hatcheries, startups, business centres. There's a whole range of particular <coughs> uses that a bank would lend itself to. And then you'll start to see the footfall coming back into the town. Because I'll be honest, I mean, hands up around the table today. When's the last time you physically walked into a branch? Uh, I was on the radio this morning once in the last year because it was a large transaction that I couldn't do online. But we are, as a population, deciding that we want to transact our banking business on a digital format. Well, we, in terms of the, the bank's reputation as well, you mentioned that too. Um, there's a lot to be said for banks who could be sitting with estate empty for a long period of time and not actually becoming a, a, a I suppose a burden on them actually maintaining it and, and, and that they could do a lot for a community by gifting it to a community. Those are conversations that are underway to be honest right. very quietly behind the scenes because you can imagine RBS in particular have been having a very difficult time in Westminster around treatment of SMEs etc just the wider uh, context but we're having these conversations behind the scenes about the biggest issue for the bank is not having to pay punitive rates <coughs> on an empty property. It's not about the insurance. It's not about the maintenance and the vandalism. It's about three, four years down the line, and there's a big sign that's just a toxic legacy. It's, it's damage to the brand, and they're aware of that. So how much better would it be if that RBS sign could be put inside the building and it becomes a childcare facility? And everybody in that community actually thinks, do you know what, they put something back. After all, they give us something back. So we're, we're, we're having those conversations, but it's a very delicate time for the bank just now. But at least they're engaging, which is important. And the cooperative bank as well. The, I, think, what, I, one the, sorry. I think Barry McCulloch, yeah. did Chima wanted to come in? Yeah. Barry I, McCulloch, I, won't, yeah. I won't surprise um, committee members that, that the FSB has a slightly different take to this than um, Phil Prentice. And I think if we do take the emotion out of the situation, and we analyse the facts, we'll find that between 2016 and 2018, there will be 258 empty units um, that weren't there before. And in vibrant property markets and city centres, as Phil mentioned, that will be filled. I think the market will kick in and alternative buyers or tenants will be found. However, in the rest of Scotland, these closures will thwart attempts to regenerate towns and high streets. It will undeniably impact confidence and have a devastating impact on the local economy and if we go back to the points that were mentioned earlier cash remains the most popular payment method for consumers and as the herald mentioned yesterday if you look at Loch Gailey who lost their last bank what the traders have seen in Loch Gailey is that shoppers and visitors are now going to Cowdenbeath simply because that's where a bank exists so there will be a distortionary effect on footfall, some towns will lose out overwhelmingly, 
And I think we, we worry about the long-term impact this will have because we know the empty units blight towns and the high streets. We know it has a massive economic and psychological impact. And given the transition that we're in between bricks and mortar retail and, and the future, we, we have big concerns about the, the future of these, the, the impact that these closures will have because I think if you, if you think about some of the units, they're historical buildings that will be expensive to maintain. And if you look elsewhere in Scotland, let's look at Creef just as, as one example, they've had a empty bank for some time and it's been a real problem site and the impact that that's had in a largely affluent town is considerable and that bank has been empty. That's been an empty unit for, for many, many years. Peachy man then. Sure. I mean, <coughs> the SGF has really carried out um, some work with a bill payment um, service company that indicates £175 million pounds, um, worth of rent and council tax payments are made through convenience stores. And that really keeps everything going. If that's the inability is being taken away, local councils really could become come to a standstill. But we mustn't just cloud over ju just the, the cash element. We've got to look at the other services, you know, whether we're taking cash out. It's, so it's about cash in, it's about cash out, it's about the change element, but it's also about the other services. If we're really going to fully regenerate the Scottish economy and Scotland's high streets, then bank lending is a, plays a big part. So if you look at coming closer to Creef, if you look at Dumblane, there's no bank there. Look at Bridge of Allen, the next town along, there's no bank there. Look at Bannockburn, there's no bank there. Look at Alloa, there'll be no bank there. So all of these places, all of these retailers, where do they go for their lending? If they want to really, you know, they've lost that contact. So it's, it's not only about cash elements, it's also about the other services that the banks provide. You know, in terms of lending, in terms of growing uh, the Scottish economy, and if we look at productivity, you know, in, in terms of um, a time, you know, when Scotland's um, uh, productivity uh, and the UK's productivity as well is weak compared to the rest of the Europe, how are we going to grow that? Um, Farhan Ashik. Um, it's just to follow up from what Phil was saying in terms of um, bank closures. And obviously, he said in Edinburgh, the, the turn is quite quick, and, and in the outer towns, it, it isn't. And Preston Pants is a good case and example. We've had the bank being shut for a year and a half now. A planning application was put in place for a restaurant to open up there with some housing on top, but it was rejected because uh, poor uh, parking space. Now, I feel a lot of the applications such as this would be rejected because the parking facilities aren't there. So what is really going to go into that empty building? empty building in a uh, prime bit of land. Secondly to that, it has had a direct impact on one of the convenience stores on the high street who's shut down um, in November of last year, and this has been there for 30-odd like, years yet to close. Now, I planned on taking on that um, uh, premise myself, but then I did my due diligence. I sat um, in, in my car on the high street just to see what the footfall was. In one hour, I counted 10 people. That is horrendous, and that was a high street that used to generate a lot of footfall, a lot of people that would be there. And another thing that Phil said earlier on, um, <laughs> that we're, as a population, we're moving to um, a cashless society, um, potentially online banking, etc. But you've got to remember, elderly can't do that. I have a customer, um, Pat O'Brien, he struggles using a computer, never mind um, doing online banking. How can you expect someone like him to be able to transition without punishing him uh, with um, with the closures. Sorry. Well, just the, what, when just um, I suppose spe spe specifically for the, the, the organisations that are represented, whether any research has been done into footfall as a result of any decline in footfall. I know we've got anecdotal evidence and Tim McCormack made a a point about how it affected your business directly, but general footfall into the city, uh, the town centre, as a result of a bank, has there been any analysis done? That's a very, very good example that I would use because of fact I've got some background with the post office. In, in the early 2000s, when the first round of large round of post office closures um, happened, Manchester uh, City undertook a huge survey on the effect of um, 
post offices closing there and the footfall. And it, it's a good report to go and have a look at because it shows the loss in revenue to the businesses beside the um, post offices in general. And they put a figure on it. It was, it was a massive um, figure just for that one city. It lost 60 or 70 post office branches in one go. So that's a very um, good research into the effect of what happens, not just when a, a bank closes, but when a post office, not just cloak, you know, in this latest network transformation thing they've got, their post offices that are closing, their outlets in the high street that are closing, they may be moving to a retail unit uh, nearby, which mine did. I moved my post office into a news agent, but my retail outlet then closed. That was it. So there was a loss of um, a retail outlet because of the post office network transformation program, and that's happened with thousands throughout the country over the last few years. So, um, Phil Prentice, just to pick up Gillian's <coughs> point, no, we haven't done any specific research, but we have a very unique data tool in Scotland, which is called USP.Scot. Uh, so, understanding Scottish places. This is a tool that was built by Scottish Government, Academia, University College London. Uh, we've got all the information around how towns function. So it's a typology toolkit. So for the first time ever, you can actually see what type of town you are, why, what other towns in Scotland you're virtually identical to. And as part of the upgrade, we're just about to launch a further iteration of that that builds in green space, health and wellbeing data, uh, digital connectivity, house price analysis. Uh, the, se the second phase of that in 2018, we're going to be deploying a whole load of sensors across Scotland's high streets in a partnership with uh, the Institute of Place Management. And that will, for the first time ever, give us real-time footfall data. But I don't think there would be any value, and this is something for you to consider, I don't think there would be any value in just specifically looking at the banks and the, the impact on footfall. Uh, it's much more complex than that. There's been such a churn and change in retail, which was always the key driver for footfall in the town centre. And until that actually sort of works its way through, just picking out you know, retail services, banking in particular, <coughs> wouldn't really give you an accurate uh, measure for footfall. So I think the message I'm trying to say is that we are moving towards having much more real-time data, which will encompass all of that chop and churn. churn around banking closures, around retail moving, uh, about trying to repopulate, etc., putting core services back into the heart of towns. And I have to say, some local authorities have done really, really well by investing, using the town centre first principle to put a range of public services in the heart of the town, which has then generated confidence from the commercial sector to come in on the back of that. So it's where you see collaboration, sort of public-private partnership, you see a lot of success. And I, I think sometimes we concentrate too much on the sort of the challenges rather than looking at some of the really good examples like the, a big role for the planning departments of local authorities in bringing people back into town centres not necessarily just retail again planning help retail more proactivity in the planning system is one of the key planks of the town centre action plan so we've seen things like simplified planning zones to try and remove some of the bureaucracy change of use so you can move from one thing to another we put more quickly uh, yeah, and I, th I think it's 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 the duty of local government to start thinking about what investments can we make in our town centres that will actually then generate confidence for the wider private market to come in and capitalise on. And you see it across the country. You know, people are gradually starting to see the town centre first principle because towns are the beating heart of the community. And uh, everywhere from West Dumbartonshire, we're seeing Dumbarton, big investment, public sector in the town centre, and on the back of that, a lot of new commercial interest. Know, people asking about the artisan centre, what else could come from this 200th year anniversary coming around the corner. So it starts just by the, the council actually initially making a good investment, moving from a headquarters out in the middle of nowhere to actually bring that back into the heart of the town in a very historic building. So there are really good examples across the country where footfall is being driven back into town. And I think we need to sort of pick up on those good examples, places like Kilmarnock, Dundee, where that sort of collaborative approach has led to significant improvement. Thank you. Barry McCulloch wanted to come in on that question. 
Uh, in, our, in our submission to the committee, we referenced research we published at the tail end of 2016, looking at the economic impact of branch closures, specifically on small businesses, but also the wider economy. One of the big implications, which will not be a surprise, is reduced footfall and reduced spend in the town centres. But I think it's important to, to reflect on Phil's points and looking at closures in the round. So it's not just banks and, and it's not just big business. It's the public sector as well and the role that they play in generating footfall. And if you think about the last three or four years and the closures that have been presided over across Scotland have been significant. So just to name, name but a few, we've had um, police stations, courts, police counters, local government buildings, colleges, HMRC, um, and that's just to name, name but six. And what these all do is they're sticky units that generate footfall. And so for what we're seeing from, from an FSB perspective is a range of bodies, both public and private, disinvesting from, from the town centre, which is making it much more difficult to breathe new life into some places which, which, um, which have seen better days. Okay. Um, move on now to questions from... Uh, sorry, Pete Chima, did you want to come in on that? And then we'll move to questions from Colin Beatty. No, okay. no very well. Colin B Beatty. Okay. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> um, I'd like to go over one or two points that have already been made, uh, particularly in the connection with the cash transactions. When everything I read from the banks indicates that cash is dead, that very few customers are, are, are actually crossing the threshold of the banks anymore. And yet you're telling me that from, a, from the retailer's point of view, they use banks frequently, and that cash, as far as you're concerned, is the primary medium for payment. Why is there such a disparity? Why do we hear from the banks that cash is being uh, phased out and that they're encouraging this and that, that less and less people are using it, but you're still, it's a vital part of your business. So how is this disparity? Why are the banks not highlighting this? See, sorry. Um, it's a question that you guys need to ask the banks. How is footfall calculated? How do they calculate footfall? Now, because right now I'm seeing independent analysis is at odds with um, what RBS is saying. And uh, there's, I've been told, um, and I need you to find out whether this is true or not. Um, suppose, say, you, you're living in Trinetna, but your local branch is in Musselburgh, and you visit your Trinetna branch regularly, but apparently they don't count that as footfall in their statistics. Now, if that is true, that in itself will uh, um, that in itself will let you know of the mischievousness of the footfall um, calculator that they've um, put out in the press, let you guys know and let us know as well. Um, I don't understand why there's such a disconnect. Every time I'm there at the branch, it's busy. I'm now there a lot less, I'll say that. That's only because I can't afford to waste an hour every week going to the branch. I have a lot of things. I'm the chair of uh, area partnership, community councillor. I've got a lot of community commitments and I have two businesses to run. I cannot be spending an hour going to the um, branch doing basic banking, which I used to be able to do in five minutes. Now, there was a suggestion earlier on, Bank of Scotland um, have... Um, set up this new facility which allows you to have um a, a, not, it's not a mobile van but one of those pickups which costs 14 pounds 12 pence i believe uh, per pickup <coughs> now this is an extra charge previously it would just cost me the, my petrol to go into my branch now i'm expected to pay an extra 14 pounds 12 pence having said that on caveat i'm not a bank of scotland customer but those who are that's an extra charge that wasn't there in the first place so they actually come round to your business they'll come to collect pick up, the cash yeah They'll charge you fourteen pounds, twelve pence for that pickup, which wasn't there before. So it could have just cost you like a pound in petrol or the walk, whichever it was how you did it in the past. From the retailer's point of view, just to add to the question I asked, how often do you go to the bank? I mean, I'm trying to gauge what your footfall really is. Do you go every day? Is it every other day? Or does it just depend on what kind of business you've got? Try twice a week. Mondays and Fridays I go. Okay. I try to do it once a week. As long as there are no armed robbers watching. Then it's Tuesday and Thursday. 
Don't give us times. <laughs> <laughs> Would someone else like maybe to give us something on the cash side? Yes, please. Uh, I think it's... Um, it's um, you, you mentioned how, how do we square this, this circle, and it's impossible, because on the one hand, you have the bank saying cash is dead, we're living in a cashless economy, and then the business community is saying it's absolutely essential to, to the operations. And, and, and that's why we absolutely welcome this committee's inquiry to shed, to shed a bit of light, because our members tell us that three quarters of them regularly visit the branch for a whole range of, of banking services. Um, and we, we, we honestly would find it difficult to digest the bank's, um, the bank's perspective here, because it just it, it directly contrasts both with our own view and with the views of our of our members, and I think moving moving forward, we ha we have to establish the facts um, because there has been far too much emotion in the debate so far. Um, and the mere fact that we do not know how many banks will be open after the closures program in Scotland in 2018 is unacceptable. How will we establish that we have a minimum banking provision if we don't know how many banks are open? Juma wanted to come in. We've produced this report for the past three years and it's produced every single year. We do provide it to all the MSPs and I'm sure you've all received the 2017 report. And it actually states in there what the, the cash turnover, of the, the percentage cash turnover is. And um, it, it is actually 76%. Um, so there's no question about that, that cash is still king in retail. But also convenience stores are, are predominantly low margin, high turnover stores. And companies often levy uh, high charges on car transactions as well. So it makes it difficult for retailers really to move away from, from cash to, to uh, uh, non-cash transactions as well. But also, retailers can't put any surcharges on, uh, on, uh, on cash transactions because the EU, EU Payment Services Directive came into force in January. So if we, when we talk about cash pickups, if we move on to, on, on to that, when, when somebody comes to pick up your cash at you know cost of whatever it is, 14, 15 pounds, that's on top of the cash charges to input into the bank that I said earlier. So that's another seven and a half grand on an average per year as well. And then obviously cash pickups depend upon your turnover, you know, and, and how you use that turnover as well. So... I mean, I, I, I sold my last store um, in, in June 2017, and we used to have a number of stores uh, up and down the, uh, down the country. Now, we used to have to bank every single day because, because of insurance purposes. Now, it depends upon what kind of level of your, your safe is covered on. Is it up to £6,000? How much can you actually take in cash to go along to the bank? Do you need two people to go along with you? You know, there are all these considerations as well. It's just not that simple. But as I said before, it, it's about other services as well. And those other services being taken away. And it's going to cause the Scottish economy big issues, you know, if we're not careful. The, this question of cash, is it driven by the retailers or is it driven by, by the clientele? By the clientele. Yeah. yeah, there's an issue here as well. Uh, the reason my store is 85% is cash is because I don't allow pay point customers, people who uh, buy, purchase gas and electricity, to pay by card. Now, why do I do that? It's because card charges cost me 17 pence per transaction. Now, the commission I make on 20 to 100 pounds, whatever it could be, is 7 pence, and that's it. That's the max. So I'm, in effect, losing 10p. Now, over the course of the week, that's 20 pounds a week. You add that throughout the year, that's an extensive amount of money. So because of the holistic picture, this is still, cash is always going to be strong. And especially, I represent a community that's in the bottom 20% social deprivation in the county, both, both stores actually, at Wimpy, uh, at Levin Hall, and uh, in Preston Pans as well. Now, this, well, we can move on to the ATM charge. I was going to bring that in uh, right now. With the charges coming in, potential charges, I, uh, the caveat I should add, 
will have a devastating impact on both communities. This is already the most deprived communities, and now we're going to charge them to take act, uh, cash for their own money. And it's something that, as small small business owners, I'm not saying that the likes of Scott Mid and Tesco's, etc., they'll be able to facilitate that because they generate multi-million pounds, so their charges, um, the card charges, will be a lot lower than what mine is, so they can afford that uh, cost. But our businesses, we can't afford that cost. Your, your charges will be. I was going to come on to ATMs in a minute anyway. ATM charges is a, a, you can see it as a good way of looking at it or a bad way of looking at it. For um, <coughs> retailers, if you've got self filling machines, we are, we're told that we're going to get a, a bigger slice of the pie. However, if you're charging your customers to get the money out, A, they're going to less likely to take the cash out, and B, that's going to have a direct negative impact on your store in terms of um, reduced purchases. Having an ATM in my store has increased my sales by about 20 odd percent. So people who come take about 200 pounds or 100 pounds out will spend at least 10, 15 pounds in my store and take the rest with them. And t taking that facility away, I'm next door to a Scotman store and I'm sure the Scotman store has a higher churn of cash. So I, my store may be the one that's earmarked to be on the chopping block because they don't want too many ATM machines within um, a certain location. Just a question I was going to ask about uh, access to ATMs. Is it uh, adequate? Is it, uh, has there been changes that have been significant in the market that are impacting? There will be huge changes going forward. Uh, the bank closures have seen that um, the ATMs have been taken away and nobody wants to take them on because predominantly these larger companies now are saying to um, the retailers, well, you've got to charge them. You've got to charge your customer because we're no longer going to be able to provide you commission. But on top of that, because it's zone A, uh, predominantly in, in, in most stores, you're now having to burden with the rates issue of that as well. And that's huge. Do you want to come in on these points? Well, there are, from my um, perspective as a news agent, I, I knew the bank was closing next door, so, and I knew that obviously the ATM was going, so I got a card machine in. So my, up until last August, my business ran successfully without a card machine, so it was all cash and checks. And um, got the, since then, I've had a card machine. And remember, as a news agent, my son's 50 pence, and whatever, the average spend is for much less than five pounds. Cigarette sales are next to nothing these days, so um, the majority of sales are... are one pound, two pounds, so they don't use cards, obviously they use cash. The customers, my customers had the opportunity to use a card machine since um, August last year and it's now stable at about a thousand pounds a month, which is like five percent of my turnover, so it's, it's, uh, it's just not used, the cards in my shop. Mm. wanted to come in as uh, well. A free to use ATM network is a uh is a key component of a healthy local economy. You know, we take it for granted, um, but maintaining that free and easy access for consumers is absolutely essential for, for business growth. You know, there, there are some stats which suggest more than a third of high street spent is contingent on the availability of a cash machine. You know, if that goes, then naturally that will have a knock-on effect for the local economy. And I think, as you, as you alluded to, all is not well with the current ATM network. You know, I think, on the whole, it probably hinders rather than helps with the availability of cash, you know, there are cases where towns run out of money, where the ATMs are unreliable, and where they're poorly maintained. And I think, as, as Fairhan and others mentioned, the situation could get a lot worse if plans put forward by Link um, go ahead. And this could lead to the closure of, of many free-to-use cash machines. We don't know how many because the payment regulator has, hasn't stepped in as yet, and ourselves and which have joined forces to... Um, to bring this issue to attention um, and to make sure that consumers have that access. So far, we've got 60,000 people who have signed the petition. There will be a debate in Parliament um, soon. Um, we just urge all committee members to, um, to raise this attention with their constituents because not, not many people know about it. And it's, it's likely to have a big impact on urban areas rather than rural areas, um, given the proposals put forward by Link. Um, but we're just trying to highlight the... You know, the economic necessity that ATMs provide, and if we're not careful, we may lose them. Just, just 
question for Ferhan. You mentioned that both your stores are in low-income areas. You mentioned also about people coming into the shop and drawing 100, 200 pounds. Is that the sort of sums that they normally draw? No, no, that's not. Um, I was just trying to emphasise the point. Um, they could draw, um, whether it be 100 pounds, uh, 200 pounds, but they would still spend that 15 pounds in the store. Now, if you remove that ATM, um, I've noticed, and I think I mentioned it, um, I don't know if I spoke to you in the past about this, uh, in the last six months, um, <laughs> what we've noticed at the end of the month, it always happens to be where coinciding with payday for a lot of companies. Um, people would draw their money. Both my ATM and ScotMed next door is always out of cash. And this has a direct impact. What I'll notice is if we've both run out of cash, there'll be 25% drop in my business right there and then. So not everyone has that ability to um, use card, but you've got to remember in socially and economically deprived <coughs> neighborhoods, they get the poorest accounts to begin with. So they don't have the probably the um, the cards that you and I take for granted, and uh, they won't have your contactless payments either. They only get those old, uh, really, really basic accounts. So it does put them in a much more restricted ability, and they don't know any better because they've not been given that facility. So they don't know what facility they can actually get. Whereas you and I will be able to. Uh, we can walk into any branch, any bank right now, and be given the best account because we we're in a different. Um, different uh, financial level than they are. That was the point I was trying to make. Okay. Um, Dean Lockhart, follow up. Yeah, th thanks very much. We, we have a couple of uh, ATM operators with us, so I'd just like to get your sort of practical experience. If, if fees are cut as proposed by the link network, uh, does that mean operating an ATM becomes unprofitable? Does, does it mean that effectively you would have no other option but to, to close the ATM available or what other options might be available? No, in theory, if anything, it's um, operating the ATM is supposed to be more profitable because you end up going to get a lot more. However, in practice, if you're coming to my store and you're going to be charged £1.50 per transaction, are you going to withdraw £10 or are you going to withdraw that £100 just because you don't want to be constantly paying £1.50? Now, if you, what if you're, um, of, again, in a socially and economically deprived situation, you may not even have that £100. You may only have... Ten pounds or twenty pounds to begin with, and that means three pounds extra charges for them. So that means a reduced spend within the store as well. So the I wanted to come in on that. Sorry, I wanted Please. to answer the the question that um, um, Dean put through. Um, what's happening at present is that we've been contacted by a number of members who have been um, there's been pressure being put put on them. Where, but they've been, they've got two choices: either the ATM goes, or they have to charge for the ATM, and the commission, the whole of the commission, is being taken away. That's happening now, and that's happening because of the interlink charges being reduced. That's absolute fact. And I just want to answer one one of the questions earlier on. Um, our average spend in a store is only six pound twenty eight. And on average, about three and a half times uh, a person uh, 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 comes into our store a week. So, and 55% of our uh, customers come from the lowest social economic groups. Just follow up. Uh, you mentioned the, the fee of £1.50 to be charged a per use of ATM. Is that a fixed fee or is it within your discretion as to what you might uh, charge? Um, the, the fee shouldn't be taken as the £1.50. They haven't set the fee, but uh, I'm just basing that on what existing ATMs right now, they charge £1.50, but the fee hasn't been set. <clears throat> but I would surmise right now, you, if you look at my ATM stats, I have a lot of people using my ATM, but that will decline substantially. You've got to realise I've put in that ATM in my stores to save me having to go to the bank now to uh, deposit that cash. So I don't actually go to the bank now to deposit cash at all, ever. It just goes straight into the ATM and it gets recycled straight back into the economy and stays within Preston Pans. And can I have a final question on this point? How often is the machine uh, replenished and, and, and topped up and the money t taken away as appropriate? 
<laughs> and this is a public forum. Can I give this to you as a... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, so, it's yeah, just... Yeah, of course, yes. I can't... <laughs> a sort of general percentage that perhaps Pete Chima could uh, <laughs> assist us with. It, it, it normally depends upon turnover, but in general about twice a week. All right, thank you. And John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, going on to the question of closures, uh, specifically, um, Ida Royal Bank of Scotland in Shettleston was very busy. Uh, the bank announced they were going to close it and then had a consultation after the decision was made. Now, I'm just wondering, if it, was that an unusual experience uh, for me or has that also been your experience? Have the banks consulted before they made a decision or is it only after they've made a decision? I mean, I, I, I'm not aware um, of the closures around us, whether they've, they've, they've done any consultation at all. It's just been announced. We had a meeting um, in London with the head of retail of RBS. We had another meeting with them yesterday, in fact, and we've highlighted um, the fact that there's been no consultations done. In fact, there's no, been no backup plan either. You know, if, if retailers, um, where, where, where are they going to go to bank their money? What are the banks doing? Uh, Second, if, sure. if, we just, if I could specifically start on the, you know, the consultation side and then we'll look at the alternatives afterwards, if that's okay. Sure. Um, right, because there's meant to be this banking protocol now that says lots of nice things about um, community engagement, impact assessment, publication of impact assessment, uh, etc. But that's not been your experience? No, and um, I had a look at that this morning again. None of that protocol has been followed. Anyone else on that point, Mr. McCullough? I think it's a it's a it's a mixed bag, to be honest. I think the access to banking protocol is a very nice document, um, but does it does it govern the um, the closures that happen locally? Not particularly. Um, I think we still see a lot of variability on where the banks are closed, the decisions that the the bank make in that locality, whether or not they consult, and generally, if they do consult before. The closures announce, which which often they can't because of commercial reasons. Uh, they they will quite often. So could you explain that to me? Why can't well, I think they? Um, what we've we've heard from some of the banks is that because there will be a number of staff um, made redundant or re or redeployed, they are limited in what they can tell people. Whether that's true or not, I, I can't say. Um, but what I think the point I was trying to make is that the access to banking protocol. Um, have really mixed up take and that what our, our members tell us is that there's very little ability to input into the consultation because the decision has been made. So the you know, I, I don't know of any situation where a bank has consulted on the closure, there's been significant community engagement and then they've changed their mind. Right, can I just check with all the others, uh, do you know of any situation where the bank has changed its mind about a closure? Indicating. I think there was one in the Scottish Borders in Melrose. That was due, I understand, from uh, John Lamont, who told me that that may have been down to sub postmaster, <coughs> which would have, who would have provided alternative um, banking provision as well because he was seriously ill. So the RBS decided to keep that one open. Thanks so much. I mean, I think we are a wee bit pressed for time. Can I come back to Pete Chima? You were about to tell me about the alternatives that the bank was maybe suggesting. Can you? Give me anything on that. Well, we, we, we had a meeting with um, with them yesterday, and we highlighted the fact that they've done nothing to proactively promote the alternatives. And if you look at RBS, they're now taking away their, uh, some of their mobile um, uh, branches as well. So they've not talked about their mobile places. They've not talked about you know the alternative where they can bank it or whether the pickups or, or or anything of such. And we've asked them to engage yet again uh, uh, with our membership so that we can actually highlight um, the alternatives. I mean, specifically on the post office, I mean, it seems to me if I go into a village or a town that I don't know, where would I get money, where is there money, the two things you would think of are the bank and the post office. So the post office seems uh, the obvious place that these services could be provided. Do you, do you think the banks are not keen on promoting the post office? Well, there's two things there. I don't think the uh, the banks have promoted the post office, and most certainly the post office hasn't promoted itself either. Um, but also, 
if if you were to go into a post office and you, you first of all got to have made arrangements that you can bank your money at that place and if you can i think the maximum limit is only two thousand pounds per day so there are restrictions upon banking again so oh, sorry mr mccullough i think the so if you if you are in a community and your your bank closes there's generally three main replacement services um, you can use online banking and you can use mobile banking units or you can use the post office and each of those have their strengths and weaknesses but given the popularity and dominance of cash um, they all suffer from similar flaws you know to take each one in turn um, online yes firms are using the facilities and technology that online and app banking offers um, but you can't deposit cash using an app to state a rather obvious point um, and Many rural businesses don't have the data or broadband connections to fully use these services. You know, often, I think it was the Press and Journal last year, they pointed out that the majority of the clo closures in the North East were in areas that had lower than average UK broadband speeds, which presents a problem. I think secondly, um, mobile banking units, there's been problems <laughs> for a number of years um, with these units. And we've had one FSB member who was robbed outside their business. Um, which was highly, highly regrettable. And aside from the security issues, there's some really practical issues that we've experienced about information on the, the routes. So wh when, when are they coming? Um, the frequency, how long they stay for, uh, and the service that they offer. And it has to be remembered that a mobile banking unit offers very basic banking services and nowhere are they a substitute for, for a bank branch. And I think the news of... Uh, the news last week or the week before that the RBS announced that they would be reducing their potentially reducing their mobile banking um, unit service um, is a concern because when the closures when the bank closures were announced and are still being announced, the mobile bank unit is usually held up as something that will offset the impact that cl that the closures will have on on businesses. And if you have a situation as as some of our members in in rural areas face, where they will have literally a couple of minutes a week. Um, to do their banking. I think it's can you see um, one, one visit uh, a week the mobile bank will make and you'll have 20 minutes. And that's every local business trying to deposit their cash, perhaps get some useful advice from their, from their key contact. I mean, just going back to the post office thing, I suppose my question is, could the post office model be improved and developed to give a satisfactory service? So, for example, I mean, banks used to have like a night safe, some banks used to have, you could put your cash in when it suited you at a different time. I mean, presumably it wouldn't be beyond the stretch of imagination that somehow at post offices you could have some kind of night safe or something like that. The issue that you could only use one post office, I mean, surely that can be changed so that you could use any post office. So, I mean, these seem to me practical improvements that could be made if the post office is the best model. And it's already subsidised, so it's already got you know, a kind of public involvement. I mean, is the post office a potentially a, an alternative, or, or is it not? Um, Tim and then I was a sub-postmaster for a number of years, and I can tell you that the post office is not the answer to the banking issues that are being raised here today. You just, uh, nobody seems to understand the amount of money that doesn't get paid to sub-postmasters for dealing with cash. And no sane person would take it on, but a sub postmaster nowadays, for £1,000 deposit, he'll get paid 20 pence. And for that, he has to count the money, make sure it's not counterfeit, that it's uh, a bag it up, make sure, um, put it onto their account system and all the rest of it. And if he loses £20, if he, t he takes a risk of that money. He, he kind of owns it at the time until it goes back to the post office in their security uh, vans. But if he takes in one forgery, one forgery of a £20 note, he's got to count out £20,000 in cash. And if you're standing, you're a retailer as well. Now you've got a, your little post office counter here and your shop here. And customer comes in to, to bank £2,000 in mixed notes all over the place. It's going to take him 10 minutes to do that. That's way, way underneath. I, mean, 
the national minimum wage. Yes. Meanwhile, the chap behind there is wanting to buy £10 worth of groceries for which he's going to make £3 on. I, I totally take the point that the post office system is not working at the moment and it's flawed. I yeah. suppose my question is, I mean, that could be sorted, for example, by the government saying to the banks, you've got to contribute a lot more to the post offices. I and, think that, and, can only and that, be, that can only be sorted by changing the post office limited management to have ruined the post office. Okay, but it could be sorted, you think? It can be sorted. If you put somebody in there who's got an idea of how to run a business, you'll get the post office sorted and back to where it should be in the high street. But at okay. the moment, those people that are running this post office have ruined it over okay. the last seven years, have destroyed it completely. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chima? The trouble is that... Um, under the transformation um, scheme that the post office has um, undertaken, the, they've gone into local post offices. So these local po post offices only take on 70% of the original services that they used, once used to offer. So in order for that to happen, the whole criteria would have to change and there would be, have to be fundamental training for staff. And, then, and, and indeed... The, the cost structure and the payment structure to sub-postmasters would have to be substantially improved in order for that to be undertaken. And the, that is most likely to go back to what we, what we had, to what we have now. I want to also take on and make a point about online banking. There seems to be a perception that online banking is free for commercial retailers or commercial businesses. It's not. It's free for personal banking. For commercial banking, um, online banking, there are charges. And these are the, these, this, this is happening time and time again. It's commercial bi um, businesses that are have to, having to bear the brunt of all charges. Just a, an indication of what the co that cost is. I mean, we've, we've had 17 pence for a card transaction before. What's online? Well, direct debit is standing orders predominantly. They could be anywhere from 13 to 17 pence. Depends what you've managed to negotiate with, with your own branch. Even to have online banking. So, for example, if you've got um, Bankline with RBS, you could be charged £40 a month to have that facility. If you've got Bankline Lite, then it's £20 a month. So it all depends upon what you have, what kind of structure you have, how many accounts you have. And then in between that, every time there's a standing order or a direct debit goes out, a check goes out, a credit card or cash in, and even cash out, it's all charged for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, right. I think Barry McCulloch and Ferhan Ashik wanted to come back in on that. So Barry McCulloch. I think just to focus on Mr Mason's points, there are a range of practical improvements that could be made to the post office network in a way gently in here, given Tim's expertise, but one, increase cash deposit limits. Two, standardise the service. There's a lot of variability. Three, provide an enhanced service for business customers. Um, quite often the expertise that a business owner will expect from a bank branch, they will expect that to be delivered in the post office. That currently isn't the case. Four, ensure the inter-account transfers are available. And five, ensure that currency exchange services are available. And that's a critical point, particularly given the importance of tourism to the Scottish economy. You know, if that facility doesn't exist in popular tourist hotspots, then we're really missing, missing a, a golden opportunity there. Uh, I would agree with uh, pretty much everything that Barry's just said. And just to add, um, when I used to branch with the RBS and they forced me to go to telephone banking, um, I used to call up a day in advance and then get my change the next day. Now that I'm with our, um, the post office, still through RBS, um, even though I'm supposed to call up a day in advance and get the change the next day, I've got a good relationship with my local post office that I can call up in the morning at 9 o'clock and by 10 o'clock I will have my change. So that's an exception, that's not generally the rule, but um, I would say the post office model at this current state, is isn't uh, right, but it could be made um, to be better. Right, Pete Chima, and then on to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Just to add, add on to Barry's points, there's another two things that need to happen. One, faster payments need to, need to happen. So, for example, at the moment, if you bank into the post office your cash, 
be it under £2,000 at present, it still takes two days to hit your bank account. It's not whereby if you went into your own branch, it would, be, it would show up straight away. So there's a cash flow issue. The second point is, and we mustn't forget about this, and it's going back to Tim's point earlier, there needs to be a substantial increase in the payment that's been made to sub-postmasters. Because at the moment, if you, if you have a look at their hourly rate, it's probably around about two, two pound fifty. Thank you. And Gordon MacDonald. Thank you so much, Convener. Uh, we've talked a lot this morning about the additional costs to um, businesses of the, the changes in, in banking and the loss of the, the branch network. And I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about the convenience stores, but there's also the license trade, there's also cafes and tourism businesses. Are, is anybody aware of any analysis that's currently taking place on to the impact in the economy of all these additional costs, whether it's security, insurance, or the cost of travel, et cetera, because uh, I think, Pete, it was you that said there was big issues for the Scottish economy because of these changes. Is there any analysis going on uh, at the moment to what the cost of the economy of this would be? Yep. Uh, we are of, um, one research programme that's currently um, organised by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, who are trying to take that that wider that wider overview of what impact uh, bank branch closures will have will have for for the Highlands, but but other otherwise than that, I'm I'm not aware of, of any other other pieces of research, um, and I think we've we've slightly been um, stuck in the headlights a little bit with the, just the, the sheer frequency of the bank branch closures, and we haven't as yet taken a step back as a country to look at what impact this will have. Is there any indication of what the cost is to an individual business of, of, of all these additional costs? You know, we've, we've talked about the lost time travel, having to travel to bank, um, you know, the cost of that travel, the parking, security, insurance. You know, does anybody want to guess how much that would that is having on an individual business? Um, we were talking about ATMs, self-filling ATMs earlier on. Um, now, that... In increases my insurance costs per annum. Um, I think it was a £200 increase per annum for my insurance costs uh, before I had the ATM to after I have had the ATM. Also, um, it takes between two to five days for me to receive that money. So once I've put it into the ATM machine, uh, once you've taken it out, it'll take between two to five days, depending on which day you took it out. Uh, so that increases um, a cash potential for a cash flow crisis. I could have a situation where a direct debit or a standing order has been a lot higher than what I was expecting and then not be in a position to pay someone else for goods. And this has happened to me a few times and I've had to explain to them that it has to happen on a Wednesday, that's when the money will come back in again. And so that is a cost which, you, which isn't seen but it is there. Yeah. Yeah. There's one interesting thing I was just thinking about. Um, when RBS closed last year, they also decided, for everybody else, decided to put their banking charges up to 70 pence per thousand from five, from 50 pence per thousand. So I looked around for an alternative because um, it was just too expensive. And we'd normally take the money from Coldstream and, and my wife would bank it in Duns. And I found this, th this um, company that would allow me to bank it in to the post office, so I'm very glad to do that, and I did that. And that my bank charges have now have because I and the money, um, Pete, is actually I put in the post office, and it's in my bank account, this interim bank account, immediately, and within an hour, it's in my RBS bank account for half the money that it cost me before, which is good for me, but not really good for the people that are um, dealing with the money. Including the sub postmaster. Hey, Fernand, you talked about um, cash flow issues. I mean, in the past, small businesses would have had a relationship with the, the local branch where they would have been able to you know, discuss with the manager what the cash flow issues were and how they could support them, or business investment, you know, getting loans to invest in your business. Now that the branch network is vastly reduced and there's no longer that access, um, what alternatives are out there? for small businesses to get advice about investment or cash flow issues, et cetera? 
I've kind of looked at it in a different way. What I've done is I've gone to my suppliers and spoken to them um, when I've had cash flow issues. Um, I've My biggest um, supplier is United Wholesale, and every time I've had a cash flow crisis, I've called them in advance. I've let them know um, that uh, this has happened. I've had an extra, say it was VAT I had to pay at that time, and it happened to be a bit higher. Um, so they've been understanding and they've known that on the Wednesday I will make that payment because that's when the money is going to go back into my account. So it has, I have teetered on the edge a number of times in this past year. It's happened a lot in this past year than it's ever happened in the past. Um, it, uh, biggest problem was it also coincided with the time with my relationship manager being ill for a long time and that I wasn't confident in the competencies of the replacements so I didn't really want to be constantly calling at the bank who didn't really understand my needs whereas my RDM knows me and he understands my needs and he could probably find a solution for me but at that point there wasn't and <laughs> because I created these other networks through suppliers and again this is anecdotal to me it's not across the board um, I have been able to maintain that and not necessarily have to go uh, rely on the banks. And given the fact that they're closing down at an exponential rate, maybe this is the way that I should be seeing it, where the suppliers are going to stay, whereas RBS isn't. Anybody else like to add? Dangerously, I was just doing some arithmetic. If you, if you knew that, you would understand why it's dangerous. Um, <laughs> but the, I was thinking about the impact on productivity and in particular the impact on our members who live in quite remote communities. So we, we have one, as we mentioned in the response, we have one, one member who, um, who lives in Dornais who has to travel to Ullapool. And that's a three hour and 10 minutes round trip. Let's say he does that once a week. You know, just working out the staff costs a year, that's a thousand pounds. I double it if it's twice a week. Um, and that's money that could, could be and should be spent in the business. Absolutely. One of the most interesting parts of the town centre review that Malcolm Fraser undertook was when he went into town centre and a councillor said, did you see our big shiny primary school on the outskirts of town? What do you think we should put in there, the old primary school? And Malcolm turned around and said, primary school. It's the same thing with the bank. And probably another close analogy is churches. You know, if, if the banks individually have to tackle this last branch issue, they'll all run away from it. But if there was an imperative to get them to work together, I think we can end up with a last branch in town solution, which will be an interim thing that will help business community moving forward. And I think we should aspire to that. We should get the banks around the table and even think of the opportunities around credit unions and some of the emerging new disruptors coming into banking. Because at the end of the day, you know, the banks don't want to lose the customers. And there is a, still a desire to have that sort of personal relationship, albeit a lot of it's done over Skype or FaceTime or over the telephone as opposed to going in and speaking to somebody face to face. But I think we should still aspire to have some form of last branch in town, particularly when you hear the issues that these guys have got uh, around all that. But we've always had to pay for commercial banking, you know, so they're, they're, that's taken, I think. Just on that very point that you said about the last bank in town and maybe shared banking facilities, I mean, that was certainly a question I raised with RBS a couple of years ago when they started closing RBS branches in my area, and I took one of the community councils along to a meeting with them, and their concern about that option was uh, staffing issues, um, security issues, different protocols between the branches, and competition. So as far as RBS were concerned at that time, uh, it was a no-no, not something they would not consider. I think they have to consider. And if it's not RBS, then it's going to be some, some of the other banks to see that as an opportunity. Uh, I, I think the point in time now is the banks are basically feeding us all the information from one side, and now we're beginning to hear it from the other side. Uh, we're not asking them to maintain branches for 1% of the population. It's the same with churches. You go into a Scottish town now, there's five churches, there's probably only the congregation for one. And it's a similar analogy with the banks. So there has to be a step change. These guys know how to run businesses. They're smart people. They're digitising, they're automating, you know, they're looking to the future. If they can't come up with a solution, there's something wrong. Yeah, well. Exactly. I, I think we're running out of time here, so I'd like to move on to... Um, Questions from Andy Whiteman. I know that Pete Chima and Fernan Ashik wanted to come in. Perhaps if you could come in and 
combine that with the answers to the next questions. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. I just want to follow up the point Phil Prentice has just made. I mean, in a sense, these banks are closing for their own commercial reasons. I mean, their productivity is extremely low because no one's using the bank. Or no customers, or much fewer customers are using the bank. And yet it's critical to part of the ecosystem of the local economy. Not all of the ecosystem, but part of the ecosystem. Uh, and therefore, is this not a classic case of market failure? And I just want to get your impression on the extent to which the private sector can deal with market failure, because it's generally not very good at dealing with market failure. Uh, because whilst you have bits of the economy in the cities, for example, that are perfectly broadly resilient to this kind of impact, the places the impact's having is, as we've heard, Loch Gelly, Durness, whatever, the private sector's not going to step in and deliver there. So if this is market failure, are we not really looking at a solution that the state has to come up with to provide what Phil Prentice talks about, which is the last bank in town, to manage that transition from a cash society to a non-cash society? Phil Prentice. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. In certain circumstances, you know, the post office isn't going to be a single bullet solution, but credit union might be able to help. And also uh, community-led initiatives at Collington, Bobberton, Juniper Green, uh, Curry and Belerno are all branch closures and they're looking at how a community bank might look in the future. I think we need to explore that as well because how would a community bank operate as opposed to a private bank? I think it would be really interesting just to see where these guys get to in terms of a community study. What does a community bank look like in the future? I'd just like to pick up on Phil's point on credit unions. Um, one of the things that Preston Pants did, um, our area partnership did, was bring in um, credit union into Preston Pants. Um, they sit twice a week on a Tuesdays and a Thursdays, I believe. Um, the only problem with that is, which is great for consumers, but from a business point of view, they don't offer business banking facilities because that's one of the things I wanted uh, to do. And I've been pushing them and pushing them and speaking to them in the background, but they're not able to. Now, if we were able to f um, make the credit union better, make the post office better, together, holistically, we could probably get ourselves out of the situation that the banks are, pro are putting us in. Pete Chima. I guess it's going back to the point that Phil made uh, much earlier today. We're looking at solutions when we've already got a solution. You know, we, we shouldn't be closing the, the last bank uh, in, in town, so I don't see that we need a solution when, when the solution is already there. We need to go back and, and really talk to, talk to these people. Um, it is very, very clear that these decisions have been made in London, and out of the 600 branches that have closed up and down the country, up and down in the UK, it's only part of Wales and the whole of Scotland and bits of the southwest of England that have suffered the most. And we've got to take that into context. And I wonder sometimes, do they really understand Scotland's landscape? Can I just pick up on that, that, pick up on that, that we have the solution? I mean, if you have... Clydesdale, RBS and Bank of Scotland and Bank of Scotland and the Clydesdale close and RBS is the last bank in town. Are you genuinely suggesting that the answer is to force them not to close? Yes. And how, how does one do that? These are private businesses. I, I mean, if, if the state tried to force you not to close the businesses that you own, how would you feel? I think the, um, the UK government, whether it's down south or up here, up here has a role to play. You know, uh, I think... If we're talking about productivity, if we're talking about the viability of businesses moving forward, and if we're really t t talking about helping local communities, then I'm sorry, but you guys have got to start stepping in uh, and, and, uh, and, and start talking to these people because they're not going to listen to us individually. Right. Um, just before we move on to, to Jackie Bailey, I mean, is it... Would you view it as being correct that banks are private businesses? They're, I mean, they are underwritten the That's financial right. compensation scheme, which is underwritten by the Absolutely. General Fund of the United Kingdom, is it R not? RBS is still owned. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, there are other, other banks out there as well. But I think the solution is there. And I think uh, you guys need to take the action. Um, Jackie Bailey. I'm, I'm curious, I think you all have contended in, in various forms that the access to banking protocol um, has in effect been breached. Are there any sanctions attached to it or can the banks just ignore it as they appear to have done so far? 
not not that I, I've been aware of. I mean, we, we've heard reports that you know after the protocol was reviewed by Professor mm -hmm. Griggs, um, that there be a renewed commitment to the protocol because obviously there was they were expecting to close um, close many bank branches. Um, but I mean, it's it's in effect. It's in effect. I don't want to belittle it, but it's in effect the paper tiger. Um, it, it doesn't actually do anything practically on the ground. And when you speak to business owners who have experienced branch closures, and for, for our, membership, our membership, that's about one and two, um, they won't know that the protocol will, uh, has existed. Um, they won't have been consulted. There won't have been the publication of open information. Um, so I, I think we have big questions about you know the viability and the effectiveness of the protocol moving forward. Um, I wonder if I can talk a little bit about the, the point explored by, by my colleague um, just now, because um, it strikes me the coordination between banks is a key issue. So we've talked about RBS closures, but just yesterday, Santander sends out an email to you know Colin Smith, my colleague in the south of Scotland. Um, they're closing their branch in Lockerbie. It's two doors down from RBS, who've already announced they're closing. Um, so, and you know, equally, Pauline McNeil tells me there's four branches going in Glasgow, one in Mulgai, and I'm sure that there will have been RBS branches going in exactly those same locations. Um, so, you know, I am persuaded of the need to ensure we have a last bank in town. I wonder whether the other members of the panel are equally persuaded. I know Pete's view, um, but I wonder about the rest of you. Do you think the government needs to legislate? or do something to ensure this happens. It has legislated in the past that, that, that the post office is enacted to maintain the last shop in the village. They are treated separately and they are subsidised heavily. And notwithstanding my comments on the current post office uh, management, the post office can deliver an answer because they, they can deliver the banking requirements, which are primarily what we've all discussed here today, is the cash, really and perhaps a few checks, but that for the retail customer is all they do in a bank these days. So, I, I must say that it goes further than that. It goes to lending, the other facilities as well, and we keep on forgetting about those facilities. They're much needed to grow to the Scottish economy. And then Farhan Ashik. I think there's, there's maybe a bit of carrot and stick required. Uh, ultimately, I would suggest getting these guys into a room and say, look, this is an issue. We're not happy with it. You've got corporate social responsibility in terms of how you support your communities, both residential population and also the commercial uh, businesses. And maybe the stick is what do we do with our National Investment Bank? You know, is there a role in there that goes beyond just infrastructure? And is there a role that maybe per perhaps we could support more widely the SME sector? Uh, so if you don't move on this, you know, we can we can move into that space ourselves. Could I agree? I mean, <clears throat> if, if you look at the uh, Lloyd, Lloyd's Bank, who are the um, owners of um, Bank of Scotland, their pre-tax profits from 2016 was 4.2 billion. In 2017, it's 5.3 billion. It beggars the question, you know, uh, wh why are they actually closing there? You know, they're making huge amounts of pro uh, profit. They're forcing commercial businesses um, to have an extra burden of costs, and they're giving them no choice. And Ashik and Barry McCulloch, uh, I think, wanted to come in. Um, I just wanted to um, pick up on, Andy, you said earlier on, um, and to uh, Pete's point, um, that RBS is a private company, uh, how can you force them um, to um, maintain the last branch? I believe there used to be legislation on the books that forced uh, banks, if they were the last uh, bank <laughs> in town, they weren't allowed to close that bank. And that, I'm sure, expired a number of years ago. Um, also, if we're thinking like that, wouldn't um, eventually the post office be categorised like that as well? They're now a private company as well. Could you technically force them to be the latch branch, and uh, given what's happening there as well? Just raise a couple of questions. And Barry McCulloch. Yeah, just two brief points. I think up, up and down the country, we'll continue to fight against um, bank closures and ATM closures, often hand in hand with MSPs and, and MPs, and, and that, that process will continue. 
But I think ultimately the UK government has to step in and conduct a thorough economic impact assessment. I mean, by our estimations, we think that after the closure programme, there'll be around 700 to 750 banks serving a population of 5.5 million and a business population of over 300,000. Is that enough? Um, what replacements need to be put in place? And I think if we're being realistic and accepting that that closure programme will continue, which I think it will, unfortunately, what do we need to do to offset the impacts that FSB members and other businesses face? And I think we need to be um, we need to be realistic, but we also need to get going very quickly because this is happening um, now and, it's happen and it will happen cont continuously throughout the year. And, and I don't think we've bottomed out, bottomed out yet. I think more closures are, are probably soon to be announced. Um, so what, what, what is that bottom floor? What is the minimum service of banking provision that should exist for the Scottish economy? All right. Well, thank you very much to everyone for coming in today. Um, we'll I'll suspend this uh, session at this point, and we'll move into private session. Thank you. Very